Hello everyone and welcome to Soul Talk, my first episode on Bridges of Light and thank you for watching. If you are watching, give me a heart, give me a thumbs up and tell me what country you're watching from. Um, tonight, as my first guest, is a healer and shaman Dawn Paul, which I hope to bring on in a few minutes. Hello Patricia, thank you for watching. I gave you a wave and just hold on a second with me until I call her. So if you have any questions for Dawn, get them ready and um, I'm just waiting for her to come on. Can everyone hear me okay? Because I don't have the headphones on today. So I hope there is no echo. And all right, Katrina. Okay, great. Thank you. My cat is trying to come into the interview. Can you see him there behind me? Hi, Dawn. Hi, darling. How are you? Can you hear me? See me well? Yeah. I can, thank you, yes. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. You're Not beautiful. at all. It's, it's my pleasure. I owe you so much, all of you, my support group. And I'm <laughs> delighted that you've accepted and you are live on Bridges of Light. Live. <laughs> and um, I know that Gitano will be watching later. So thank you, Gitano, very, very much. Yes, thank um, you for the invitation. Now, our viewers, if the sound gets funny, let me know and I'll put my headset on. So far, I think we're doing okay. Yes? Yeah, good. We're getting hearts. Um, I, I did introduce you a little bit. I've done a little bit of a live broadcast um, just a short while ago. But for the viewers who joined us now, I would like to tell you a little bit about Dawn. I've met Dawn, what is it, Dawn, now? About 20 years ago? <laughs> Around there, <yeah. laughs> And um, actually, it was Andrew who met you first um, at yeah. a lunch with friends. And he came back saying, you must meet Dawn, you must meet Dawn. And we had a very special link because Sahar and Dawn mean exactly the same thing. So Sahar yeah. is an Arabic word and the equivalent is Dawn. And by the way, it is also the time when you start your fasting in Ramadan. So to all our viewers who are observing the holy month, the holy fasting month of Ramadan, we wish you a happy Ramadan. Ramadan Kareem. Um, so that's the connection, Dawn, and we're doing this during the holy month. <laughs> and you have two Dawns. <laughs> <laughs> Bring us of light, yes? Yeah. Okay, Katrina is saying that the picture is blurry. I don't know why. I see Dawn very well. Maybe, Katrina, you have um, a low internet or something. Dawn is a shaman. She's also a healer of souls. Her first book, by the same title, A Healer of Souls, was published in uh, 2012. Her intention was to provide a helping hand for her readers on how to face um, their life, how to get out of the mess that they find themselves in, more importantly, how to build, as she says, a new reality for themselves. And this is what we're going to talk about today. What is reality from the personality point of view? And I just want to clarify, Dawn, in my definition, what I call personality is the person who is incarnate in this body in this lifetime. So I call that the personality. And the rest mm -hmm. of the consciousness, which is out of the body, we can call it the soul or we can call it the rest of the consciousness. Do you agree with that or do you have different definitions? Yeah, that's fine. Fine. Okay. So Dawn um, also completed Dr. Alberto Veludo's healing the Light Body School. She trained with the Four Winds Society. She also had further training in Peru. She visited the Amazon, the Sacred Valley, the Machu Picchu uh, mountain, and she also learned from Jose Luis Herrera of the Rainbow Jaguar. Now, all of that might sound exotic um, to people who don't know about shamanism, but we will talk about it in a few minutes. Um, I also wanted to tell you that she completed her, the medicine wheel, the inner child training with Carla Fox, and many others um, on the path, including many shamans, but particularly the Kiro shamans, which come from the sacred mountains um, in Peru. Um, she also went to California. She did Theta healing. Dawn then went on and studied emotional freedom technique and um, quantum touch. She also did Sufism with Sheikh Burahuddin in Spain. 
Um, but her background, interestingly enough, is in the financial world. She worked in banking and she was a consultant in business, um, specializing in corporate pensions. So Dom, that was a big leap from the city <laughs> to shamanism. Yeah. <laughs> can you, no, can you not. tell... Can you tell our viewers how how did you stumble upon it? How did it happen? I, I don't know if I stumbled upon it or it stumbled upon me. I think I've been looking for something from a very, very young age, but had no idea uh, what it was. I think about the, at age 16, I was on the spiritual search. And of course, then that's quite long ago now. And so it was quite underground and um, took me a very long time. Ended up working in finance for probably 20, over 20 years. Uh, but I was very, very unhappy because I knew I was supposed to be doing something special, yes. you know, something different. Uh, so um, I spent a, an awful lot of time on an awful lot of courses, studying an awful lot of things, looking at a reading lunatic, basically. I mean, it was just, um, you know, I had piles of books by my bed and I was going through them and I was praying, please, please let me find my things. And I think it took um, something like 25, 28 years to find shamanism. And I didn't even find it. I think in the end, I just got so angry and I threw everything out of the house, all the books, the coursework, the really? crystals, everything. I went on holiday to Peru and when I was at Peru, then I had a vision at Machu Picchu that told me to follow this path. So um, in the end, it's sort of- But it's you, went like there, you went there on holiday, right? You weren't like looking yeah. for anything. You went to Peru uh, on holiday. I was, and then I, was angry. I remember the story you told me you were coming down and then suddenly you saw something and you weren't sure whether this was real or not or imagined? Yes, I came down from kind of the highest point and there was... A, Sorry, I just want to say a couple of hellos. Hello to Nick from Dubai and hello, Stewart Pierce. I'm very glad you're watching. And yes, let's talk about Akhnaten. He's a dear relative. <laughs> I've yeah. seen a comment from Stuart actually about uh, Akhenaten and Nefertiti. So that... Yeah, we have okay. uh, interesting things to talk about. So, um, yeah, so basically I came down from the highest point of Machu Picchu. I could see all of these Inca around me. I was really angry because I thought there were people dressed up, you know, that you have your photograph with, like in Rome, the gladiators, so that sort you, of thing. Um, so you thought it was like a touristic thing and this yeah. um, pride, I thought, if you will, went it? up to meet you? Yeah. yeah. How, how could they do this in such a sacred place? I was so angry. And then I noticed that the the Inca, they were quite kind of, it's about 20 of them staring at me, but they started to fade in and out. And um, only two were left. There was one completely covered in gold armor and then another um, with, uh, in the what I presume is a normal dress. And uh, they it was very scary. I didn't know who they were. Um, at one point I thought I was dreaming, you know, I was looking for my quilt <laughs> and uh, they basically told me to follow this path and that they would help me. And that was 16 years ago this year. And Gosh, I've been working wow. worldwide as a shaman since then. Not an easy path, as anybody on it will know, but I love it. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but I remember when you told me the story, you said that one of them was like an energy figure and that energy kind of upped and then went inside you? It, it didn't, one of them was kind of, I think the energy itself of Machu Picchu, the okay. Apu was recorded, the Holy Mountain Spirit. The other one that looked kind of normal, um, it, it grabbed me by the throat and took something from my throat and threw it down into the river valley and then basically just told me to go down the stairs and said, you know, you've got what you came for. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So um... I, I remember when we had a session um, and, you know, at some point, like, you know, I closed my eyes and then when we were done, you said, you know, how did it go? And I remember telling you, yeah, I kind of felt it when you blew onto my face and you said, I blew onto your face. And I'm like, OK, but it just felt to me like you have close energies or guides who work closely with you. 
yeah that's really the point of being a shaman so it's it's about um being the conduit the clear or the conduit between heaven and earth the spirit world and this world and allowing spirit to work through you so when i'm working with clients and i'm talking to clients i never really feel that it's me talking you know it's almost mm. like they're talking through me and information comes in and i can get it out and th that's really you know we work with the mountain spirits the mountain spirits work through me uh, and they are um i'm a conduit for them so effectively they are doing the work as well as me helping people with obviously the information and the guidance that i have does does that make sense but isn't that true of all healers or light workers yeah that we are just the vessel really you know whatever it is that you do whatever yeah. kind of healing and spirit yeah. or energy or whatever or the source whatever you want to call it works through us but isn't yes. it that isn't that also true that this is why we need to kind of check ourselves and make sure that our vessel is clean clear of any drama trauma grounded work with integrity because whatever you channel the quality of whatever you channel will be affected by the quality of the vehicle itself absolutely so um i remember having a client uh, mentioning to a client once that i have a friend in france and um, um and she helps you know uh, work work done and I remember this client saying well you have work done and as you know really surprised and I said well <laughs> I, I'm always working on myself because I can only take my clients to my frequency as far so, as you are absolutely as far as I can get that's as far as I can take them so it's my duty to continue to work on myself and to clear and to cleanse everything else to try and get higher and higher so that they can get higher and higher as we're not de developing i'm only going to get people to a certain point yeah so i explained best... um er, sorry yeah yeah i That's explained fine. earlier in a little bit in a little a short live video that i did earlier about healing that we every living being has an energy we are as human beings electromagnetic beings um, so we do have an energy and anything that we go through gets kind of registered or stored as memory in our energy field, good or bad. But if it is bad in the sense that if it's a trauma or a negative event or incident, if that memory is not, um, if that event is not dealt with, if you like, then the memory registered and eventually filters into the physical body. So healing is all about clearing that energy, whatever form of, of healing that you follow. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the shaman in Peru there will say that, you know, disease starts in the energy field. So Absolutely. You, you can, if you know, if it's lung disease, for example, you can, I've had somebody, to, it's in my family, I've had a, a shaman in the jungle take it out of my energy field before it even reached the physical. Um, yes. But there's there's kind of a diff a few different things so if we have trauma it can register in in the energy field it can block a chakra for example it can put what we call an imprint in the energy field as well that acts as like a magnet to bring similar experiences to us that we probably don't want and then also we can create can i can i um interrupt you there so for viewers who don't know if you've got any kind of, um, what shall we call it, impurity or a block, um, because everything in the universe is resonance. You know, we say as within, as without. So if your energy is interrupted or distorted, what will manifest in your life will also be distorted and blocked. You'll experience struggle. So can I ask you what kind of um, issues do you deal with? I looked at your website and the first thing that you mentioned on your website is you deserve to live a life you love do you think we suffer because of lack of self-love is that the root cause of the root cause of our problems i actually think it's a root cause of every problem because um obviously as i said before i've been doing this about 16 years and it doesn't really matter what has happened to people the the actual issue becomes what that person then does to themselves so how they stop themselves from growing from healing from taking part in life from joining in from having the life that they want you know trauma happens as a child beliefs are created blocks are created 
scattered and it's almost like that's the sunshine life that's the sunny world or the rainbow world as i call it that people want to be in but they're they're caught in the dark world and they're looking at it thinking that they can't have it and i perceive my job as clearing uh, clearing them from the darkness and from all of the things that keep them in the darkness so they can open the gates and go into this world of light does does that make sense yes, yeah. yes absolutely absolutely yeah. And I think we are... can help as, as much as we can. But I think also what I do, for example, with my clients is I help them realize that they must hold themselves accountable because you can have all the healing that you want. But unless you make an effort to come out of that maze, unless you make an effort to see the world differently or, or perhaps to understand that we all go through hard times, it is how you respond to your situation that makes the difference. Which is a Buddhist principle, isn't it? It's not what happens to is you. It? Yeah. It's how you it's react. Major one. Yeah. And I spent yeah. most of my time teaching Buddhist principles. So it's not what happens to you. This is if this is you. And then you have some um, conflict come. You know, our normal we don't normally think and we just react. Oh my god. Yeah. So yeah. it's the Buddhist teachers that this is the only freedom, not this, whatever this is, whatever this conflict is. It's about knowing that in that split second you have a choice as to how mm. to react and yes. you can go into your old ways which is oh my god you know or you can kind of go oh that's interesting what do i have to learn from this and i think you know we've been talking a lot obviously and it, it is about taking the soul's view i think i've got something actually oh, here we have this uh this is from peru i don't know if you can see it it's oh yes a serpent yeah. oh yes yeah with yeah. a jaguar yeah. on the back oh yeah and an eagle on top of that so the oh, serpent wow. it's three states of perspective so the serpent represents the ego mind you know the base needs food water uh, fear obviously then we've got this the jaguar is the emotional self and the eagle is or the condor is the higher self the soul yes so right. so if you think about the serpent and the jaguar they're on the earth the serpent's very low down can hardly see anything the jaguar can see the bushes and the mountains in the distance but right. the eagle lifts up and it and it sees the whole thing from a completely different vantage Fantastic. point like so literally I, a bird's eye view yes so my job is to get people out of the emotional state that they got, get locked into and try and get them to see whatever's happened to them, whether it's childhood abuse, sexual abuse, P, you know, soldiers, PTSD, that sort of thing, to try and see from this point of view and to understand effectively that, that we are all eternal beings. There is really no birth, no death. It's a, a, just a constant change of experience. Does, does that make and sense? And whatever, whatever is happening is not personal. It is what we need to overcome or develop so that we don't react in the same way. That's I, it. I think this is the growth happens outside the comfort zone, doesn't it? Yes. Well, we should always, there's a, a saying that we should always be feeling uncomfortable, slightly anxious, because that's the, the sign that we are. This is when we grow. Yes. This is how yes. we grow and develop. And I think the biggest issue I have overall with clients is that they, get, they find a comfort zone and they stay in it. It might be hugely uh, uncomfortable. I think a comfort zone is a ridiculous word for it because it's not comfortable at all half the time. It's more about a known zone. You know, they know that it's, state. It's more of a cocoon. You know, we had a guest yeah. yesterday on Bridges of Light and she, she was talking about... Um, um, James William or William James that he said that are three stages of spiritual development like the butterfly so the cocoon you think is comfortable but it's actually a prison because it's limited and then eventually you get frustrated and you know it's it's a period of transformation too so even when you feel stuck that could be the time when we decide to make changes that is the transformational time um, I just wanted to say, like, you know, it's not the end of the world if you're going through a problem because that gives you the rich material to transform your life. Absolutely. And I think what people don't understand is they want to try and get from where they are to where they want to be without too much problem. So, yes, 
always say to them is that the caterpillar doesn't just go in the cocoon and sprout some legs and some antennae and some beautiful wings and pop out and fly off. It, it gets absolutely um, mulched. It, it gets actually turned into black liquid. Yes. So there's nothing left of the original form. Yeah. And then yes, from that, that's amazing. the butterfly is formed. And in the, it's that's the amazing. struggle as well to get out of the cocoon because they don't just pop out of the cocoon. They, they have to spend a long time trying to get out. And there are people that have tried to, you know, help them a little bit, you know, to maybe cut the cocoon a little bit. And the butterfly just plops out onto the floor and dies because it's the struggle to get out of the cocoon that makes the wings strong enough for flight. That's so amazing. So it's like things, literally a labor of love and the end result yeah. possibly equals the labor pains. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I try and be positive, you know, because when something hits you and when I first started, I used to call it karmic balls, you know, like karma in the sense that whatever decision you make, because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yes. So if you've done something and you've gone on um, unaware, there will be something at some point, you know, that hits you and you have to face it and you have to deal with it, but it isn't really personal. Um, in the little things, we can deal with that, but maybe in the bigger things, you know, like death of loved one or developing cancer or something, um, we react to it in a very big way because it's really shocking and we take it personally. And this is where you mention like a little bit of the soul kind of leaves the body. Um, can you tell us what is soul retrieval? And, and when, when does it happen or what causes it? Okay, so, so soul retrieval is the healing process. It's soul loss that, that occurs after trauma, any, any form of trauma. It normally occurs between the ages of naught and 10, and then it starts mm -hmm. up a recurring pattern of, of similar experience. So it, it normally starts when we, you know, we have that realization that, that you know, you know, when you're a kid and you're jumping off the stairs and you're climbing in trees and everything's yes. more, and all of a sudden something happens. It could be you have a big accident, end up in hospital, or mum dies, or grandpa dies, or something. You know, it kind of makes you go, oh. And and the best way to describe it, and it's not very nice, so forgive me, but if if you read in the newspaper about um, somebody that's been raped they will report that they came out of their body and they looked down upon the act happening to them, but they weren't in the body at the time. And, and so if you imagine that the body is like an, an orange, the physical body is like the, the skin of the orange and the soul is like the segments of the orange. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. So imagine yeah. a horrible thing happens and the segments, they all come out of the orange and it, and that's to allow the person to get through the experience. But let's say 10 segments come out, but 10 segments don't go back in afterwards. So maybe so, only- Hold on. So do they leave when bits of consciousness or bits of soul leave? Is that to make us less sensitive so we don't yeah. get even more traumatized? So it's a form of protection. It's a form of protection. Okay. Yeah. Because the soul is fragile and the soul knows it. You know, and the souls are always in and out of the body. I mean, we go out of our bodies at night in dream state. Yes. So. Right. So it's important that so the, the person needs to be less than. Yes. Immediately after the event and maybe for some months afterwards. And the idea is then they get proper healing. Yes. Proper healing, yes. And and that historically that healing would have been shamanic healing. Yes. So, so, so are you are you basically I, saying that when bits of the soul leave due to a traumatic event, we actually have less energy in our physical bodies yeah. and that in yeah. itself that, might cause problems? The, the juiciness, the yes. energy and also the personality. So I think you've probably, hi Elizabeth, I think you've probably um, seen people and you can see that they're not quite there. They're not fully wow. present. You know? Yeah, they're almost like, um, well, I wanted to say traumatized. They are traumatized, but they're almost like absent-minded, you know? Uh, yeah. And so this is, so they think they can get through the, 
the period of trauma and heal from it. And then it's necessary to go and get those healed. We go and heal the soul and then we go and get the healed soul part back and we put that in the body along with That's gifts and resources that then help the person to move which, forward. Which are symbolic. So, you know, as energy, it's expressed as symbols that might help the person um, a little bit extra, a little bit extra yeah. help, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like when you put all these, you know, like high technology oils in your engine, you know, like at the gas station, they keep telling me, oh, you need this. Can we put this engine oil? I'm like, OK, so that the car can run better. So you retrieve the soul or bits of the soul that are missing and sometimes also bring gifts to kind of sweeten the deal so that the soul stays in. Is that what you're saying? It, well, the, the person needs to be kind of moving forward in a new way to help the soul part stay in, but the gifts help the person move forward. So it gives them resource okay. support. Uh, and, I understand. And we also bring power animals in as well, just to help them because this is a kind of a healing modality that doesn't form dependency. So you're giving people gifts and, and resources that they can use themselves. Okay, I want to interrupt you and move on to another um, uh, thing that you have on your website, which really attracted my attention. I, I quote, you said, a shaman needs to understand what a client experiences during illness or trauma. He or she needs to be very strong and unafraid of death, as shamanic training often involves facing or interacting with death. Being a shaman is a dangerous occupation. <laughs> And shaman cannot be afraid of death, but you experienced death at the age of eight, didn't you? Mm-hmm. 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 I um... so is it really dangerous being a shaman? I mean, yeah, it's not good. It's intriguing, <laughs> but yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, it's very. You know, you have a lot of power, and but you're. I mean, I've been trained since being a child everything that's happened to me and you know what's happened to me I, I i'm happy to share i went through the menopause at uh, between 13 and 17 because normally you don't get to be a shaman until you're post-menopausal um i didn't realize that that's at the interesting. time lots and lots of illness um lots of suffering lots of loss lots of illness in my family with my father and my brother um and and obviously myself you know keeping myself going and i died at um eight on the operating table with my appendix burst but it was Gosh. it was the kind of strangest thing it was like being a pair of eyes in the corner of the room but up by the ceiling looking down and i could see a body on the table i could see the doctors and the nurses all running around wow and, and it took me ages to realize you have a wow on the you table have all these my... comments, yeah. Don't forget you to look know? at the, our viewers' comments. You've got a wow and very <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> so was that like a near-death experience? I think it was a death experience. Like there was no- It was kind of, a death experience. You know, I think and when I realized the body was mine, there was zero emotion. You would think I would have gone, <gasps> you know, but it was just like, oh yeah. And then they tipped my body upside down to try and get the acid out so of my body. So you were watching. So you were literally like out of body. Thing. It was like watching a yeah. television program. Yeah. You know, like, oh, oh. Amazing. You know? And, but there was no emotion whatsoever. And then the next thing I knew, I was just waking up in the bed and the doctor came to me and, and he said, have you got any questions? And I went, oh, yes. Um, why did you tip me upside said, down? Yeah. And, and he kind yeah. of went, <laughs> so, and he ran off he ran out the ward you know and um i've had you know lots okay, of okay let me just um welcome our new viewers please um let us know where you're watching from we're talking to don paul who's a healer of souls and a shaman so we've discussed what the soul is um we've discussed why the soul leaves the body when we go through a trauma and we're talking about literally death because a lot of shamanic work involves death and that a shaman must not be afraid of death. And Dawn was just telling us about her death experience when she was eight years old, how she watched herself um, or watched being operated on, didn't you? That's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But really on a, on a different, in a different context, shamanic healing is all about death and rebirth. So if I get a client 
like we talked about, you know, the caterpillar going into the cocoon, it, yes. it dies to its old self. Yes. And then it is reborn. So the whole of shamanic healing is all about the death first and then rebirth. Death of the old, all the old ways, all the old being, you know, the way, all the, the things that, you know, we hold on to, the comfort zones, everything else. And then the birth of the self that can go and claim that rainbow life. I always say to clients, yes. you know, when you're an artist, you have a blank canvas and you have all the colors. You what can kind start of painting or creating a new life. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. really, um, for me, you know, with my recent experience, it's really been like the darkest hour is the one before dawn. Um, because it has been very dark. And I was just sitting in the garden and I told this to Gaetano. And, you know, everything was dying. Everything was brown. And then suddenly about two, three weeks ago, I, I looked around and, and everything is being born. And it suddenly hit me that even in nature, death is necessary for rebirth. So it's part of the transformation and, and that kind of helped me see that, you know, death is not the end of it all, but it's a new beginning on a different level. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, there is no death. There's a, you know, the person leaves the physical realm, but we, we aren't these bodies. And this, so this is part of the teaching. For example, may I use you and the Andrew? experience yes, absolutely. You know, the conversation. Yes. so talking about moving from the the emotional state to the soul perspective the bigger picture the bigger yes, picture yes. is that we are eternal beings so we can all get very upset when people die i had a client this morning her son sadly committed suicide and but now she understands that this is part of his journey part of his journey is to help her actually on her journey to break her patterns and we, we found yes. today that this has been going lifetime after lifetime. Gosh. So the person's just, this is not reality. And I knew this from being three years old. I was like, why is everyone taking this so seriously? This is not reality. This is where everything gets played out. And up there is home. So everyone that we love is up there. I lost my dad nine years ago. I miss him on the physical every day because I can't phone him up and say, how do I fix mm. this light, for example, yes? But yes. I know he's around, he shows me every day, you know, that he's around. Um, but it's about just knowing that they're all there, we're all connected. We're all in the yes. same soul families, we are probably billions of years older souls. But what, what is it about this connection? Is it the more you acknowledge the connection, the more that you're supported? Is it like literally being plugged into the national grid? The more that you're aware that we're all connected, then there's plenty for everyone and you never really lose anyone because the, the, the soul is energy and energy is never destructed. Can never yeah, be destructed. Physics shows us that it can't be destroyed. It can be moved and it can be transformed, Changed, but it can't be destroyed. Yeah. yeah? So therefore... In a way, my, my view is that, you know, I, I'm obviously, I'm not worried about death at all. I quite like not to have to, you know, have indignities and suffering and that sort of thing. But I've never been scared of yes. death, yes. you know. Uh, so and it's actually, always you know, Tibetan yeah. women and Taoist women, I read a book, um, I can't remember the title, but he come to me in a second, where these women chose to die because they really managed their energy well. And when they did, there was nothing left of the physical body. All the energy was transformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you, you don't to have to have a drama body. is what I want to tell our viewers. You know, yeah. you don't have um, to have an ailing body. You don't, you know, there's so much conditioning about people getting older. And, you know, we, we say, we also say in Arabic, like having one foot in the grave, you know, and it's your right. mindset that affects your body and your health. Don, I want to kind of move into the core of the subject, which is shamanism. What is a shaman? Um, as I said before, I mean, you, shaman... you're the first shaman that I've met. So what is a shaman? <laughs> a shaman is a person. Well, shamanism is the first form of, uh, first system of belief, first system of healing on the planet. So it's older than religion. It's older than everything, basically. And we all know it because we've all had it at some point. Um, so the shaman historically would be um, chosen by nature, normally struck by lightning, yes. 
um, or it comes down, you know, the family. Normally struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. So Even one of in my ancient times, gosh. Well, yeah, uh, more in ancient times than now. Now, I mean, the, the normal way is to have a vision like I had, or to be struck by lightning. Uh, or, or have a very long difficult illness you know because mm. the the suffering is part of the shaman's path you can't help people unless you suffered basically so the shaman acts on behalf of the community and he is a mediator or she's a mediator between heaven and earth spirit world and and this world and bring goes to the spirit world and brings back information for healing mm -hmm. for so tells me for example what to do what the client needs which may not so be that is that is only possible because we mustn't assume that you know all the viewers know about shamanism hi barbara where are you watching from let us know so that is only possible because we are connected and all energy is connected so for you it's possible to connect with a different node of energy or level of knowledge because as a shaman, you know how to navigate the energy universe. Is that right? There's I'm, like, I'm trying to put it in layman's terms so that like people can relate world. to it. There's, different, there's three different worlds. Um, so there's the upper world, which is like the super conscious realm. There's this world, the middle world, and then there's a the lower world, which is not a hellish type, type place. It's just another world. And that's normally yes. where soul parts go to for safety. Yes. Sometimes to the, they go to the lower normally. world. To the lower world for safety. So they go to the serpent level? Uh, no, that serpent level is the level of the ego. So it's oh, just a, okay. a world beneath this world. So, and it's, But it's not a scary place. And so that's when I go to get those segments of the orange back, that's where I have to travel to, basically. Oh, I see. Really? So the showman would be there and the, uh, the village, if you like, would normally he'd live on the edge of the village. And, and he'd be responsible for the health of the village, for the animals, for the crops, for the uh, births, for the deaths, for the for ceremonies, for marriages, everything. But my point is he can only do that if he has a feel and if he's connected to the grid. Because, you know, otherwise, how can you communicate with animals and um, people and know their condition and illnesses if he wasn't? From but my point of view... They get chosen by nature. They get chosen yes, by nature. Yes, yes. Because they're, they're connected to it. Hit by lightning. Yeah. You know, my, my teacher said, well, he's actually, a, um, he was a, a guide, if you like, um, that he was struck by lightning. And when he was... Yes, up, I like that story. Can we tell him? Yeah. He knew everything. He knew all of the, sh uh, sh how to do the shamanic Hi, healing. Rula. Thank you for watching. Rula is one of my classmates. We did the holistic um, um, healing uh, course, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy. So we've got people from Italy, Jordan, UK, Dubai, Patu. I don't know where you're watching from. Let us know. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching. Yes, sorry to interrupt, but I must um, honor our viewers. Of course, of course. No problem. No problem. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see all the little messages coming up. Um, so, so, yes, that's basically the shaman's role to look after the community. But now, of course, with communications, I work well yeah you work online and you don't even need to see someone we'll get to that but i'm really intrigued because you also said that there are two types of shamans can you tell us a little bit about that in my lineage so that there's two yeah. types the what we call the pampa ah. side which is the normally the the more earthy type of shaman so they might work with um animal Herbs. spirits and herbs so they might be an ayahuasca for example um but they probably using things people like the reindeer tribe you know in mongolia that work yeah. with the spirit yes i understand the, yeah. uh, the reindeer or the lake and then there's yeah. ultima Sayox, which are quite rare i'm a mount ultima Sayox, and they work with higher level spirit so oh, wow it, we've got viewers it, from south africa cape town wow nice to see you Tikva. Oh, Thanks, Katrina. So, you, yeah, so, so you say you, you work directly with high level spirits. So I understand. So you could do, you could be a shaman who works with herbs or plants, but you actually work um, directly with, with the level of spirits. But, but what a, a, an Ultima Sayot does is also, I, I, I don't know if you remember me telling you that for five days before a session, I work on people while they're asleep. Right, right. 
Just and why is that? In the old days, do you remember the, the milk bottles that we used yes. to have? And yes. they sit on your doorstep and all of the cream would come to the surface. All of the heaviness in the milk would come to the surface. So basically, I work on people while they're asleep. And that's bringing the cream up to the surface. And in the session, we just kind of skim it off. So if somebody books a session with you, they don't have to be in England and you don't have to see them and you can actually work from a distance. Yeah, absolutely. And also I don't have to speak to them. I mean, I work with um, autistic, severely autistic children um, anywhere you know, in the world and disabled people that can't communicate and sometimes even people that don't have the language at all. Um, so, for example, with the autistic children, I just do I just have their name, I just do the work, I get all the information that I need, and I just type it all out and I send it so, to So, like, what would you need from a client? Their date of birth and what their issues are, or just their name? Normally just a name, and but it helps if they, if they have something in particular that they want to work on, then it helps me, because I can ask those questions. If, you know, if it's for, let's say, um, I don't know, self-confidence issues, then I can um, work towards that. I can focus everything on that. Does that make sense? So, so th yes, I do. I, I mean, I understand. And if our viewers don't, please um, send us questions if anyone would yeah. like to ask Don a question. So basically what you're saying is shamanism is probably a unique healing modality because you don't need to see the person, you don't need to be connected. You can do the work, you can um, do the soul retrieval or the shamanic healing, and the person doesn't even have to be present nor speak the language. True, but I, th and obviously in the cases of, you know, autistic children, they don't have any choice, although they do speak to me, they do give me a lot of information for the parents. But I think that because of the way that I work and giving people opportunity to talk and taking people on the journey so they can see themselves, the bits of themselves have missed or the, the patterns that they haven't realized, I think that's quite, um, it's quite um, healing in itself. So I like is to there, through it. Is there, is there a dark side to shamanism? There's a dark side to everything, isn't there? You know, if you have can, a, can you? a knife, you can have a, you know, you can have a heart surgeon give you a heart operation with it, or you can have somebody, you know, stab you with it. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, a comment from Katrina Don. And she is mm -hmm. saying, I was told by a Peruvian shaman, I'm 95% shamanic energy. I felt in total alignment in Peru. And she had a life-changing experience. Is that a common thing? I mean, is there, like, can someone tell you you have 95% shamanic energy? Or, or is it she was told that because she was in Peru? Peru's got very, very high energy and it's very thin between the veils between the worlds. So people do tend mm. to have a lot of experiences there. Um, I th my sense is, and, and there was a big argument on this, my sense is that shaman are born, not made. Mm. So I know that I've been doing this job in many, many different lifetimes, in probably all lifetimes. Um, and, and it's something that you're born as. So that's probably what the, the shaman was picking up on. If I have my my chart and my natal chart done you know the stars when you're born yes yes people say are you a shaman really it's actually in my stars you know amazing and at the moment it's quite difficult because there's lots of people kind of doing weekend courses and then saying i'm a shaman and i'm a shaman and yeah yeah not, and it's getting quite popular i now. guess i guess you know with with energy work you can learn it but then there's a calling and then there's also your soul's experience whether you've done it before whether it's your life purpose to do it whether the wisdom is there as a result of many lifetimes and I think yeah. that makes a difference. But, you know, it, sometimes it upsets me because there is a commercial side to everything. Um, even, even spirituality um, can be a commercial machine, you know, where you want to certify people and graduate them in shamanism or tarot readings or whatever it is. But because you're dealing with very high level energies, integrity is a must. And, um, you know, I, I don't give my endorsement to anyone unless I've tried them for many years. I know how they work. 
um, how they deal with it. Because if there is no integrity, you, you're dealing with mm -hmm. high level energies that you can actually cause somebody a problem rather than heal them. I've had so many mm -hmm. people who were disturbed because they didn't have a proper um, form of whatever, you know, bioenergy healing or Reiki healing or whatever it is, yeah. because they've been kind of experimented on. Yes, absolutely. I think but, we always, what I say to clients is that they always have, if you're going to go and see question. somebody, you must always trust your gut. You know, always trust your gut. And if it doesn't feel right, just go. You and have you a question. That's why I'm quoting, yeah. Fatou, have a Fathala is asking, is your shamanism like Castaneda? Um, well, I think the, the thing is that there's, there's many different lineages of shamanism because it, it's the first peoples yes. of the earth. So um, all shamanism has the same basis. It has the, the three worlds. They might just use different powers like reindeer or lakes or a mountain mm -hmm. or does that make sense? It's all the same principle. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like, yeah, yeah. It depends what your lineage is. And um, I, I didn't get into Castaneda's books very much, you know, um, but, but somehow I resonate with the Peruvian, but especially you, your people, the like hero, you know, like I, I could understand or feel, although I knew nothing about Peru um, and, and the Kiro tribe. Yeah, they're, they're amazing. The people, the people in Peru, they're like, they're so powerful, but they're like little children, you know, in the, in, when they're working, <coughs> they're even serious. when they're not working, they're doing like cartwheels and forward rolls on the lawn and you're kind of like, okay, you know, but it's, they just don't take themselves seriously. And as you said, there's a lot of ego now in spirituality, you know, I'm more enlightened yes. than you. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and it, that's quite sad, but then that happens in... Very sad uh, or like, you know, protecting your methodology and it's a secret. And I think, you know, this life, as I call it, it's like the national grid. You need to give and receive. And the more that you're connected, the more that will come to you. But yeah. very few people yeah. understand that. You know, like I promote you, I promote her, I promote him, because it all comes back. And, and if you work from a place of integrity, then you would welcome that kind of connection. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, viewers, yeah. any more questions? We've got 10 minutes left. You know, when you, you've worked as a healer for a very long time and I've worked as an intuitive and a, and a mentor for more than 25 years and, you know, you're just sitting behind the desk or a table and, and, you know, working with clients, whether online or in person, there are no career lines. We kind of have to make <laughs> yeah. our own, yeah. you know, there yeah. is no guidance. But let me ask you, where do you see yourself five years from now? What do you hope to create? I can't believe you asked that. Who knows? Who knows? I think that, you know, I don't, I, I just feel really blessed. Lena's on. Hi, Lena. Um, I just feel really blessed to be able to do this work and to, because um, you're writing part a book. Of it for me, you're writing, a writing book. You're an amazing a interior <laughs> designer. And I have to tell everybody, <laughs> you're an amazing landscape designer. You have the most amazing <laughs> gardens, the most amazing home. <laughs> And it comes kind of with that um, sense of intuition, doesn't it? You know, like you have a sense of where things should be and, and how they should look. Like Katrina, who's my next guest, seems to think my background is messy, but I love it. That's my space. <laughs> and I yeah. love to get things. But you're working on a book. And, and what, what else? What would you hope um, to do? I mean, let's have fun, you know, let's finish what we came here to do. So what do you have on your to-do list for this lifetime? Um, yeah. I would really, I'm really interested in, um, you know, helping people that, that, for example, you know, the military that struggle with PTSD, I think shamanic healing is brilliant, fantastic. Can really that. help. Be nice to mm -hmm. get some more research done into that. And I'm looking at that as a, a possibility. Um, I am writing a novel uh, based on a true story, which I'm quite passionate about. Obviously, I have uh, my book here, which is uh, oh, yes, still doing please. really since um, 2012 and I think we've got 50 nice reviews now that and it's lovely to get you know messages about that uh, as well from all over the world but your, and how your it's book um, wait 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 don't kind of brush over your book your book is really important because not only because it's written from the heart but you write about yourself your journey how you've dealt with all these mystical things that were happening to you you mention mm -hmm. a lot of client cases um, why their dis-ease have developed, 
how you've helped them. So in a way, it's almost like um, a manual of how to handle life or how to pick up the signs yeah. and recognize that something about yeah. you or your energies are discordant and it's not the end of life. There are people who can help you deal with it in a natural way before you wait too long and then it really becomes a problem. That's it. I think it's, I, I call it a helping hand on your journey through life because I obviously I've been on this journey a very long time. Um, I think since I was three really started asking questions and I, I've fallen in many, many pit holes and I see clients going into the same pit holes. So I thought if I put them all in a book, then I, in, to some degree, I think people have to go into the pitfalls to learn from them yes. themselves. But uh, yes. then effectively, um, hopefully people can walk around them and kind of go, oh, I can see what's happening here and they can walk around them and or not spend so long. I mean, I spend so long looking for this path and reading thousands of books and getting really frustrated. And um, I you, say you to wanted you, to find a system that works and, and this did. does. I, it, uh, well, I mean, lots of healing modalities for me. Um, they, they're like putting nice energy onto a rubbish tip. And the, the person feels nice for three or four days, but then all of the supermarket trolleys are, you know, pushing up, for example, and the exhaust pipes. And yes. I wanted to find something that removed the rubbish tip and then put the, the light in and then return them to wholeness. And but, that's why I love this work um, because, it, you know, if we're traumatized, Sahar, we're traumatized on all levels yeah. of our being and all of those yeah. levels have to be healed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, Otherwise, was you'll be, you'll be carrying you. that emotional baggage with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She gave you a very yeah. nice comment about your book. Um, Elizabeth says that Dawn's book was a great help to me and her healing sessions. Thank you, Elizabeth. But also, Dawn, you mm -hmm. took time out and you did your master's. You went back to university. And um, what was that about? What do you hope to do with this? Oh, I'd like you, to Lena. take Thank the work. <laughs> Thanks, Lena. Um, I, I want to take the work into business because I think there's an awful lot of dysfunction at high level, CEO level, C-suite level. Um, and the business has such an impact on uh, uh, the population and the, the earth, you know, the, the environment. So if we can raise consciousness and heal these leaders to be, and help them to become better leaders and more conscious leaders, then all of the stakeholders involved in the business, the workers, the society around the business, the suppliers, the customers, the products, you know, that are better, um, and they're not putting toxins in rivers and yes. using yes. bubbles and things, then I think so much the better. Yes. Yeah? I think I think capitalism maybe went to an extreme, you know, wh where greed kind of really set in at the expense of the planet and its people. I mean, uh, for me, when I communicate, you know, with Mother Earth, it's it's very obvious. We're almost like parasites living off of her rather than we own her and we have to exploit her. But you yeah. know what? A friend of ours from Dubai went to Stanford um, to do her master's and her master's is absolutely amazing. I mean, when she talks about it, when she came to visit, it's almost like she's in a holistic course, you know? So I think mainstream universities um, began to teach that kind of awareness and build those kind yeah. of leadership, you know, this kind of leadership. I mean, absolutely yeah. incredible, you know? And I, I, but but yeah, you also... It's not yeah? and, uh, sorry, I went, my, my university, Nottingham Trent University, had a very big focus on the environment and ethics, you know, and so it was great to do the MBA with them. Um, but it, I think it's important, you know, and we have all of this stuff about, you know, shamanism really is about looking after the earth. If you look after the people, the people love themselves, the people are going to love everybody else because you can't love people if you don't love yourself and you can't love the earth if you don't love yourself. So there's a comment us... from Zakia in Canada. She says, good luck with that, Dawn. CEOs are selected according to, to their so, sociopathic <laughs> tendencies. <laughs> yeah, yeah we true. know all about that. It's funny, a lot of, um, you know, whatever, light.